Thank you all for sticking with the lectures. This is the final lecture, and generally speaking, you know, the number of students decline as the course goes on. But thank you for coming. So I'm going to talk about the first bulk nanostructured metal. And you'll understand why it is the first as I go along in the lectures. But before uh, I introduce the concepts, uh, we use adjectives like mega and giga and tera without actually thinking about what those terms mean. And of course, that applies also to financial crises. You know, it used to be the case that millions of pounds were needed to support the economy. Now it's trillions of pounds. And what does that actually mean? So when we talk about a mega pascal, how can you communicate that to a non-scientist, right? Uh, because I'm going to talk about gigapascals, so we don't actually know what a megapascal feels like. So this is an apple, okay? And weight is a force, and an apple weighs about one newton. That's absolutely true, okay? So an apple weighs about one newton. If you put it onto one square meter, that's one pascal. So when we talk about one megapascal, that means a million apples on one square meter. And if we talk about one gigapascal, that means a billion apples on one square meter, and probably you end up with the juice uh, at the end. Okay? So this is the feeling that you need to communicate to your friends in different subjects when you say, look, I've made something which is you know, a gigapascal strong. A square meter of it could support the weight of a billion apples. Uh, back in 1956, you could actually make pure iron which had a strength sufficient to support 10 billion apples on one square meter. That's not far away from the theoretical strength of iron, which is about 22 gigapascals. And that's back in 1956, without any alloying, without any uh, deformation. The catch is that as you increase the size of the crystal, uh, the strength collapses. And that's, uh, the reason is that these are single crystals. And when they are small, they have perfection. As you make them larger, the probability of finding a defect such as a dislocation increases. And therefore, the strength collapses. So this was known back in 1956. And I want you to retain this in your brain, because I'll come back to it later. So um, this is the wire that I showed you yesterday, which has a strength of 5 and a half gigapascals. And it's made by stretching about 50 grams of iron into two kilometers of thread. And it has incredible ductility. You can tie a knot with it. And I explained to you yesterday that if this was carbon fiber, you could not do that. Okay? Now, this is made by deformation. And when we look at the atomic structure of that wire, all the phases have been mixed up. And the scale of the crystals has been reduced dramatically. Given that here we are getting strength by putting defects inside the material, you lose the size sensitivity. So here uh, is the original graph that I showed you from 1956 on the single crystals, uh, tiny single crystals of iron. And this is the strength introduced by deformation. You lose the size sensitivity. The only problem is that if you put severe deformation, then you limit the form of the product, You know whether it's a wire or a very, very thin sheet. And just to illustrate that, there's a crazy unit used for defining the dimensions of a thread. So it's one denier, which is the weight in grams of nine kilometers of fiber. Now, why would you define a unit like that? But it exists. Okay? It's a bit like British thermal units. And a man's sock would have a thread which is about 50 denier. And a woman's stocking would be about 10 denier. And cipher is finer than the thread that goes into stockings. So you're not going to be able to make uh, big engineering components out of things in which you get strength by severe deformation. Okay? So this is not a method of getting uh, nanostructures which are useful. Then this story broke uh, a few years ago, rather like graphene at the moment. Uh, and you know, have a look at the journals in which this is published, Acta Astronautica. So carbon nanotube, this is a carbon nanotube. 
has a strength of 130 gigapascals. Okay. And the modulus is six times that of iron. So, you know, this is the stuff that dreams are made of. 130 gigapascals and uh, 1.2 terapascals of modulus. Uh, so, there was an old Russian comic which proposed that the best way to go into space is actually by building a space elevator. And for that, you need a rope which is 120,000 kilometers long. And therefore, it has to be able to support its own weight. And before carbon nanotubes, there was no material that could do that. Okay. So there were lots and lots of stories about space elevators. NASA sponsored a program. There are people here from NASA, right? Yeah? Uh, or your group. <laughs> your group leader is from NASA. Yeah, so they sponsored programs of $17 million uh, on space elevators. And students were going around in the department saying, you know, 10 times stronger than steel and so forth. So that raises a red flag to me. Whenever someone compares something with steel, they are trying to exaggerate their claims. So basically, elementary thermodynamics, which I explained yesterday, tells you that uh, the free energy consists of two terms. One is enthalpy, and the other is configurational entropy. This term opposes the formation of a defect. So let's imagine that the small delta G is the enthalpy change when you form a defect. So this opposes it because you are increasing the energy of the system. On the other hand, this favors the formation of a defect because as soon as you put, say, a vacancy inside a cluster of atoms which doesn't have a vacancy, you increase the number of arrangements possible. In other words, the probability, uh, the, the disorder, the entropy increases. So when you balance these terms, you get the equilibrium number of defects, equilibrium number of defects. That means there's, they're not there accidentally, they are there because equilibrium demands it, uh, will, will be a function of the free energy of formation of that defect and will depend on the number of entities you have inside your sample. In, in the case of a carbon nanotube, the number of carbon atoms. So when you use that calculation, you can show that you cannot scale the properties of a carbon nanotube. Right? It's fundamentally impossible. And if you look at the literature, beyond a two millimeter size, there is no carbon nanotube which can beat steel. Okay? So, I sent this paper to NASA, in fact. And you don't hear about space elevators anymore. Okay? <laughs> because go back to 1956. If you have a perfect sample and you scale it up, you will get defects. And defects will compromise the strength of a perfect sample. Same applies to graphene. Yeah? So there was a story in Nature recently of graphene being fired at by tiny silica particles. And then they extrapolated that to body armor. It makes no sense whatsoever because as soon as you make that sample of graphene larger, you will have defects. So the only way to test this is to make the authors of that paper wear that body armor <laughs> and then test. <clears throat> okay, the second problem with very, very strong materials is that if you actually exploit that strength, then there's a huge amount of energy stored in the form of elastic strains. And in the case of uh, an object with uh, the carbon nanotube, which has been stressed to 130 gigapascals, you actually store more energy than dynamite. And because the modulus is large, the propagation velocity of that explosion would also be greater. Okay, so a carbon nanotube stretched to 130 gigapascals is more powerful than dynamite. So if anyone in NASA had done an engineering degree, they would realize that this would not be a safe thing to use to transport people into space. Okay. Right. Summarize. Strength produced by deformation limits the shape uh, to things like wires or sheets. And strength in small particles relies on perfection, so it is doomed when you increase the size of the sample. We knew this back in 1956. Now this is a, a grain structure, and the shape of a grain in three dimensions is roughly a tetrachydodecahedron, 
consisting of hexagons and squares, so we can work out the amount of surface per unit volume. And that surface is a defect. Okay? So it has a certain energy per unit area, which is this sigma. And as you reduce the grain size, you will have more surface per unit volume, because the surface per unit volume varies with 1 upon the grain size. So if you want to make the grains finer and finer, you've got to provide that energy from somewhere. Okay? So you start off with coarse grains, you want to make them finer, there's a certain amount of energy you need to supply. And if I plot that curve of the energy required, uh, if I provide this much energy, then I can reduce the grain size to a very small number. This is 0 0.01 of a micrometer, that's uh, uh, 10 nanometers. Okay? The trouble is, uh, if you look at all thermomechanical processing that has been done in industry, and this is a way of producing bulk samples in hundreds of millions of tons, where you hot deform steel in such a way that you don't allow recrystallization to happen, and you get extremely fine ferrite grains on transformation. So this is a process which serves humanity very well. You know, there's about 40 billion tons of these steels in service without anyone noticing it because they are so reliable. Yeah. So the comparison I always make is with your mobile phones or with your uh, computers where you need updates every couple of days. That's not proper engineering. You really want to forget about the technology behind the device that you are using. So steels are not uh, recognized by normal people because they serve them extremely well in very difficult circumstances. So thermomechanical processing uh, began really in 1960 when microalloying was discovered in Sheffield University. And almost all structural steels are thermomechanically processed now. But they haven't succeeded in getting to a grain size which is finer than about one micrometer. Okay? No matter how much money has been spent on research to get even finer grain size, they did not succeed. And the reason is when you make a large sample, and you get a phase transformation, it heats itself up. Okay, so there is it's a, something called recalescence. The heat of transformation raises the temperature of the material, and therefore the driving force that you're providing is diminished. And if you allow for recalescence, then you're not going to get to a grain size much finer than one micrometer, whereas what we want is a nano-structured material. So, this is the research proposal. Okay? We want to create a bulk nanocrystalline steel, which is very strong, tough, and cheap. But we need to put some substance on this, because this is too easy. Okay? Uh, this is uh, a truck, which is huge. We, I took this photograph in Alberta, uh, at the oil sands mines in Alberta. And just to show you the scale, uh, I'll show just one of the tires, and that is me, okay? So what I mean by bulk is I want to be able to make engineering objects which are as big as that, right? Not small samples. And they have to be big in all three dimensions. What do I mean by nanocrystalline? Well, you know, we've got carbon nanotubes. We should have crystals which are on the scale finer or equivalent to carbon nanotubes. That's a good definition to use. And what do I mean by cheap? Um, this is bottled water, okay? And it's a brilliant marketing campaign because, you know, you can perfectly well drink water out of the tap in the US, yeah? Uh, but we pay, I don't know, maybe a dollar for this bottle so we can afford to waste money and transport it over long distances probably from a spring somewhere, right? So we need to make the material as cheap as bottled water by mass or by volume, okay? That is an affordable price. So let's see how we might be able to do this. Well, if we use phase transformation, then we don't have to put deformation, and therefore we can produce any shapes, okay? But we need a certain number of criteria satisfied. First of all, when you make the crystals finer and finer, the defects inside the crystal sink into the boundaries. Okay. So you almost have perfect crystals left with grain boundaries around them uh, when, when they are nanostructured. Uh, 
That means when you pull the material, there's no work hardening capacity. Okay. So a lot of the studies that were done to produce nanocrystalline materials, you pull the material and immediately you have a plastic instability. So we've got to introduce another mechanism of work hardening. Because if you get plastic instability, that's not a safe material. Plastic instability immediately after yielding. Then we need to sort out the recalescence problem. That means the heat of transformation. We need to dissipate it somehow. And of course, uh, that dissipation becomes easier if the rate of transformation is slow. And it's always the case that if I transform at a lower temperature, then I will get a finer structure. Okay. So let's try designing something. Now, this is a transformation in which you start with a certain arrangement of atoms. And then, without breaking any of the bonds, you redefine the unit cell. And therefore, you get a large deformation. Okay. And remember that this deformation happens inside the bulk of the material. So we are pushing against all the surroundings. So that causes elastic strains. And that strain energy is very large. It's of the order of 600 joules per mole, which is much greater than, for example, a diffusional phase transformation where you just need 10 joules per mole. So if you choose a transformation product which has a displacive mechanism, then you will not get recalescence because the enthalpy change of transformation is dramatically reduced. Okay? And just to show you that this is not uh, imaginary, this is a movie where we're watching the surface of the steel, and you will see crystals of bainite growing. There's no etching involved. These are actual physical displacements produced by the transformation, and they are very large. The shear strains of the order of 0.26. So if we exploit this, then we are doing well. We will get rid of the problem of recalescence. OK, so this is a, a, an atomic force microscope image of a crystal of austenite transformed into bainite. Uh, and you can see the massive upheavals here. So you can measure those quantitatively and show what the strains are. Now this is the mechanism of the bainite transformation, where initially bainite is precisely the same as martensite. There is no diffusion involved. But the carbon then escapes into the surrounding austenite and precipitates as cementite. This is no good for high strength steels, because when you get to strength levels of the order of gigapascals, the cementite itself is a brittle phase and can compromise the strength. Of course, it's different when you're drawing wires, because it's a, effectively a compression that you're doing. But in a structural material, which is subjected to complex stresses, cementite can cause premature failure. And I explained in the last lecture that we can stop this by adding silicon to the material. And we end up with a nice mixture of just uh, ferrite, bainitic ferrite, and carbon-rich austenite. And the advantage of having that austenite is that under the influence of stress or strain, it will undergo a martensitic phase transformation and add work hardening to the material. So it's a classic method of enhancing the work hardening capacity and avoiding early plastic instability. This is uh, what uh, a structure would look like, in which we just have these very fine plates of bainite and retained austenite. And this is not a nanostructure. This scale is one micrometer. But the concept is exactly the same. We've got carbon-enriched retained austenite between these fine plates of bainitic ferrite. And the strength here would be of the order of 1,600 megapascals. So I want to make it finer even finer than that. I want the plates to be nanostructured. So I want to transform at a lower temperature. The previous structure you saw was at about 400 degrees centigrade. So then you need to ask yourself the question, what is the lowest temperature at which I can produce bainite? And we now have all the theory necessary to do this calculation. And it is the first time this question has been posed so we did some calculations of how the bainite start temperature, the temperature at which you can obtain bainite, varies as a function of composition. And this is just an illustration. And the key is that you must maintain a gap between the bainite start temperature and the martensite start temperature. 
And according to the calculations, I could produce bainite at room temperature. So this is in Kelvin, so this is room temperature. Okay. I could, in principle, produce bainite at room temperature if I made an alloy with this chemical composition. But there is a catch. Yeah. And that is kinetics of transformation. So these are calculated kinetics. It would take me about 100 years to produce bainite at room temperature. Now, of course, you know, wine gets more expensive if it's older, right? So we could just make the material, leave it for 100 years, and then sell it for a very expensive cost. Yeah. But I could not convince any of my industrial colleagues to go along with this. So what we did instead was we chose about 10 days for transformation time at 200 degrees centigrade. OK, so we designed this uh, alloy. It's very simple. There's about 1 weight percent carbon. The silicon is there simply to stop the cementite from precipitating. Uh, we have molybdenum because all commercial steels will contain phosphorus as an impurity. And when you have a high strength steel, that phosphorus segregates to the austenite grain boundaries, and then they break at the boundaries. So molybdenum can be added to gather that phosphorus. That means to pin it down and stop it from segregating to the austenite grain boundaries. Because to remove phosphorus is very expensive in a commercial material. And then we have some manganese and chromium to retard the high temperature transformations, such as perlite. We have a low transformation temperature. It's about 200 degrees centigrade. We have sufficient hardenability to avoid uh, things like perlite, uh, reasonable transformation time of 10 days, and no cementite. We have a little bit of vanadium to control the austenite grain size by microalloying. And the heat treatment is very simple, that you produce austenite, and then you transform it at whatever temperature you choose. OK, so this is the structure obtained. Okay? Notice that this is a scale of 40 micrometers. And any meta metallurgist looking at this would not uh, be convinced that there's anything extraordinary here. Okay? But what I want you to see is that it's isotropic. Yeah? You would get the same properties in all directions. The next image I'm going to show you will be at a much higher magnification. And therefore, it can be misleading. But it is spectacular. OK, so are you ready? OK. So this is the structure in a transmission electron microscope. Look at this scale. This is 20 nanometers here. OK. Um, maybe you can't see it, but trust me, the thickness of the plate is 20 nanometers, because the magnification marker is hidden over there. Uh, and this is a carbon nanotube at the same magnification. So transformation at 200 degrees C for 10 days, and we have these fine platelets of bainitic ferrite embedded in a matrix of carbon-enriched retained austenite. It truly is a nanostructure. And it is very strong, of the order of 2 and a half gigapascals. And it has uniform ductility up to something like 27%. Um, there's no deformation involved in producing it. It's just phase transformation. No rapid cooling either, because the transformation is slow. And therefore, you don't build in quenching stresses, for example. And it's extremely cheap. You saw the elements that go into making it. And I will show you that it's uniform in large sections. Right, these are some typical mechanical properties, depending on how, uh, what your transformation temperature is. Uh, and you can see these are fracture toughness values, which are quite reasonable for strength levels uh, of this order. And here is a, a stress strain curve. And you can see there's quite a lot of elongation there. So if I plot uh, the elongation versus the amount of austenite that I have, um, this curve doesn't actually pass through 0. Okay? So there's something strange. It would imply that I need a certain amount of austenite in the material to get ductility. So we did some tests where we have three samples with different retained austenite content. And here is the strain that you impose during the tensile test. And the retained austenite content would decrease along those curves. And fracture in all of the samples happens at approximately 10% of retained austenite. 
Now, the reason for that is that let's imagine that the blue phase there is austenite. I can draw a continuous line through that if, if the fraction is above a percolation threshold. Yeah. So if I start a fire over here, it will spread through to the other side. Yeah. That's the meaning of percolation. As I pull the material, the austenite starts to decompose, and at some point, I will lose percolation. That means I can't draw a continuous line through that structure. And that austenite, of course, has transformed into high carbon, untempered martensite, which is a brittle phase. So as soon as you lose the continuity in the austenite, you get fracture. So that is the model for the elongation, and I will come back to that model later on. This is just a standard percolation theory, which we applied to the particular shapes that we have, and it confirms that the percolation threshold is approximately 10%. So in order to probe this further, um, we used hydrogen. Okay? Now, hydrogen has a high solubility in austenite, but a very low diffusion coefficient compared with ferrite. So supposing that we measure the diffusion coefficient of hydrogen through this structure, then it should increase dramatically once we go below the percolation threshold. And that seems to be the case. Below the percolation threshold, we get a large increase in the diffusion coefficient of hydrogen. And of course, it's not just the volume fraction, but the shape that matters. Because if I take another sample in which the austenite is not in the form of percolating films, then I get a large diffusion coefficient. Okay? So this structure is good in preventing the penetration of hydrogen into the steel during service. The material is now being used uh, and produced commercially for a number of applications. Uh, I will also show you some features which limit its applications in commercial life, but for the moment, this is a commercial product where this is an armor. And I'll show you the properties of that armor later. This is a, a device produced in Spain for crushing uh, scrap metal. And my colleagues uh, in Spain and elsewhere in Europe are also working on these fuel injectors for diesel engines where they require much greater strength because they want to increase the pressure inside the engine. The armor uh, properties you measure by something called ballistic mass efficiency, where you take the mass of ordinary armor to defeat a given threat and divide by the mass of a test material to defeat that threat. So effectively, you are taking account of density here. Okay? So this comparison is a fair comparison that this is the normal armor, this is titanium alloys, alumina, which can only take one shot, and this is the new armor, which has a ballistic mass efficiency approaching a factor of three. Okay. Now, this is a picture that I took in Heathrow Airport to illustrate the size of a conventional civil aircraft engine. Okay. Now, of course, they are much bigger with the A380, for example. But look at the size of the lorry compared with this engine. Yeah. These things are huge. And if you take a cross-section of that engine, uh, of course, you have the titanium fan blades here, which are very large. And you know, if one of these fan blades breaks, then the momentum released is so high that the engine undergoes violent vibrations. And in order to compensate for those vibrations and to turn the engine off before you get much more damage to the aircraft, the shaft has to be able to bend to accommodate that imbalance. That means the shaft must have plasticity. And the shafts are made out of steel. And for the future generations of aircraft engine, you have basically reached the limit for either nickel-based alloy shafts or for steel shafts. So we are trying to see whether we can make these shafts out of this bulk nanostructured steel. And these are actual blanks of the bulk nanostructured steel. And here we are heat treating it. So this, this has been austenitized, and it's going to be put into a salt bath at 200 degrees centigrade. And it's too expensive to leave it in there for 10 days. So you take it out, and then you put it into a pizza oven for 10 days. Yeah. So 
that's a, a shaft application. It will take a long time to know whether this is realistic or not. And in particular, we need to think about the temperature stability. The shaft can reach momentary temperatures in excess of 400 degrees centigrade. And it's not certain whether the austenite would remain stable, whether it would decompose into a mixture of ferrite and carbides in those circumstances. So the carbide precipitation happens. This is the iron carbon phase diagram. Uh, this is ferrite, austenite, and theta is cementite. If I extrapolate these phase boundaries, in this region you can get cementite precipitation. It might take very long because we have silicon, but eventually you must get it. Okay? And this line here defines the carbon concentration of the austenite from the mechanism of uh, the bainite transformation. So in this region, the material in the long term, I don't know how long, but in the long term, it would be unstable to thermal activation. So what we are trying to do is to redesign it so that we fall in this region, in which case there's no driving force for cementite precipitation. Okay. And these are our initial results. This is the conventional uh, nanostructured bainite, and this is the latest version where we have temperature stability to, uh, well, this is a continuous heating experiment uh, done in a synchrotron so that we can measure the fractions of phases. So it's not strictly uh, saying that, you know, we can tolerate 600 degrees centigrade because in service you would be there for a much longer time. But temperature capability has been improved and we are working in all the other properties that go along with that. Now, um, the reason why I showed you the picture of the oil sands mines in Canada where we had that big truck is because there are major problems with steel over there. You know, you, you are basically pumping a mixture of oil and sand and water through pipes. And those pipes are eroded within six months. And then they turn the pipe around and then the other part is eroded, and then you have to replace those pipes in one year. So I speculated that maybe we could use this material for such a circumstance. And a lot of work has now been done on the wear rate. And of course, the wear mechanism depends on many, many factors. Yeah? So things that we do in the laboratory may not be representative of what happens in real life, but this is, these are initial results where you can see that this structure has an incredibly low wear rate in dry sliding conditions. If there is also water, this may not be correct. Okay? So that needs to be established. <coughs> but the reason why this is uh, good in wear is that you don't actually produce a lot of debris. Yeah? You can see that there's quite a lot of uh, deformation at the surface, but you don't pull off things because it has quite a lot of toughness. It doesn't have cementite particles. And the mechanism, uh, the, the, what this indicates is the hardness below the surface. And the hardness is a maximum at a depth. What that indicates is that the sliding is not actually uh, important. It's the rolling that is important because it's producing a stress under the surface, as in bearings. And you can do calculations to show that the stress is at a maximum below the surface, and the depth of that hardness peak corresponds to the depth in this calculation. Uh, we knew, actually, that these materials are good in wear. Uh, about 15 years ago, when we designed the lower strength variant, you know, which wasn't nanostructured but had a scale of one micrometer and a strength of 1600 megapascals. So we produced uh, carbide free rails. And this is the carbide free rail, this is the normal politic rail, and we are looking at rolling contact fatigue in full scale tests where we have wheels going over the surface of a rail. You produce a stress under the surface and then this bit flakes off, uh, which means failure. In the case of the bainite, you simply, we simply had to stop the test because these were doing, uh, being done on a full scale and they are very expensive to do. So rolling contact fatigue problem is eliminated with these rails. Here we have the wear, wear rate, and you can see that this is the only structure which reduces the wear on the wheel as well. 
Yeah. All the others, if you improve the properties of the wheel, you make the properties, uh, sorry, if you improve the properties of the rail, you make the properties of the wheel <laughs> suffer. Okay. And um, I, I also have a picture somewhere of a track in the USA, a test track, where they continuously run heavy trains uh, with the Benetic rail and the normal politic rail, and you can see that the damage is a lot more with the politic rail. Okay, Dr. Zaretsky, <laughs> okay. he's our bearings man. No. Um, I, I want to illustrate to you uh, the technology of bearings very briefly. Okay? Uh, so these are incredible objects, you know. They take such a lot of pain and yet they serve uh, us very well. You, know, you could argue the world rotates around bearings. Okay? In your house, you will have approximately 300 bearings. So imagine that you have this ball running on this raceway. A typical contact stress would be 2 gigapascals. Okay? Um, the number of revolutions per minute in an aircraft engine is 25,000 revolutions per minute. That's correct, isn't it? Well, it depends on the size of the engine. Okay. Small, but, small engine, yes. Mm. Bigger engine. Okay, so let's assume we have a small engine, um, and let's assume we have just 20 rotating elements. There'll be a lot more. That means that the number of stress pulses that something uh, that the raceway experiences in a minute is about half a million. Okay, so just to show you how much the material has to tolerate, and there's no other material than steel that can do this. Um, I want you to feel the pain. Okay. So imagine that you are being punched on your face with a stress of two gigapascals, half a million times a minute. So these are incredible materials, and we want to do better. The problem is that there are so many variables that you have to control, because you wouldn't put an object like this into service because failure has very important consequences, okay? So it will take some time. And SKF in Sweden have invested in a large research center in Cambridge to deal with all these issues. So, you know, it's not just rolling contact fatigue. You might have axial loading. Uh, you might even have tensile stresses, hoop stresses, uh, hardness, toughness, hydrogen resistance, ductility, corrosion resistance, reliability. Okay? Uh, you know, we are having big problems with uh, bearings for wind turbines. So, you calculate a life from experience, and they are failing erratically at much shorter times and not predictable times. So those are not reliable. Uh, you need to be able to manufacture whatever steel you design. Uh, machining, forming, forging, grinding, heat treatments, dimensional control. You know, Dr. Zaretsky uh, once told me that a whole class of bearings produced had to be scrapped because after a few months they changed their dimensions. Yeah? And that's why with the aircraft engine bearings they do multiple heat treatments to get rid of certain phases which cause dimensional changes. So you go to 550 degrees centigrade cool, 500, maybe five times before you actually say that this bearing will be stable. So what I'm going to show you, uh, I want to emphasize, is an incomplete story is that this is a normal bearing steel where we have these particles of cementite. The vast majority of bearings are made from this kind of a structure and the fine structure in between is martensite tempered at a low temperature, something like 160 degrees centigrade because the hardness uh, has to be very high, about 62 Rockwell. And the problem is that during service, uh, we have some defects inside the material, inevitably. And those defects are beaten like this by the contact stress. That effectively causes mechanical alloying, local mechanical alloying of the microstructure. So here you can see homogeneous regions which are known as uh, butterflies and white etching matter. Because they have been homogenized, the carbides have been taken into solution and the hardness here locally is far greater than the hardness here. So this, this would be about, um, I'll use Vickers, this is about 800 Vickers hardness, this is more than 1,000 Vickers hardness. 
because the carbides have been taken into solution and you've introduced lots of defects in the process. And you might be able to see that there are cracks here. Okay, they're not propagating, but eventually. Uh, they're, they're not uh, uh, critical cracks, but they are growing. So one of the issues is that we have these large carbide particles, and there is a reason for having them. Uh, we need the material in a very soft state during the manufacturing process, and these proetactoid cementite particles help to produce a spherodized structure which has a low hardness. If we eliminate those carbides, and this is the uh, carbide-free bainitic steel, we don't actually get the white etching matter. Okay? The mechanism of damage completely changes. Uh, you can see here there are some voids forming. Okay? And if I go to the next slide, these voids are forming in the region where you have the maximum stress, maximum Hertzian stress, and there's an awful lot of branching of the cracks, uh, of the um, linking voids. This is a ductile failure mechanism. So this holds quite a lot of promise uh, because we will not get that white etching matter, and if it forms, it will not be hard. These are early tests, and the mechanism of failure is not brittle. Okay, so we are working very hard on this concept for bearing steels. Uh, this is just uh, to show you the branching, and I think that, uh, yeah, the, the voids actually nucleate at the interfaces between the ferrite and the austenite. The austenite has tripped into martensite, so you have a hard phase and a relatively soft phase, and therefore you nucleate voids at the interfaces. Okay, um, I'm going to slightly change the story now from applications to some fundamental discoveries that we've made as a consequence of uh, this particular effect. Now, I said the mechanism of transformation is that you form like martensite and then you partition the carbon. And the solubility of carbon in ferrite, which is in contact with austenite, is incredibly small. Yeah? Maximum solubility is of the order of 0.028%. But when we measured the amount of carbon that's in the ferrite using the atom probe. Uh, this was back in 1981. We found much greater concentrations remaining in the ferrite, even though in this particular case, the transformation was a 400 degree centigrade where the carbon is mobile. So we explain this by saying that the carbon must be at dislocations, not in solution. Yeah, because it, it is beyond uh, my imagination to say, look, the solubility is 0.02. We are detecting much greater concentrations. Therefore, it must be at cotral atmospheres. OK, and there are plenty of dislocations in the structure. So that's a reasonable interpretation. Until this lady came along, <laughs> OK? And she totally put a spanner in the works and produced results uh, with the modern uh, atom probe, which can collect 10 million atoms in one hour, you know, whereas the instrument that I used in 1981, we collected about a million atoms over a period of three days. So basically what she showed is, is that, yes, of course, you have, uh, you have um, carbon at dislocations. That's natural. But she also looked at the regions of the lattice where you do not have defects and found that you have enormous concentrations of carbon, well beyond the equilibrium concentration. And I could not sleep when I saw this result. Yeah? Nothing to do with coffee. I could not sleep because it does not make sense. So I asked uh, my colleagues in Korea, uh, for, first of all, these are the experimental results. Look, look at the concentration that remains, even though we are holding at 200 degrees centigrade for 10 days. Okay? Carbon can easily diffuse at those temperatures. So against all expectations, we have a huge excess of carbon in ferrite, and it stays inside the ferrite in spite of the heat treatment, which, in, which is long and at 200 degrees centigrade. And in normal bainitic steels, you know, the austenite is actually harder than the ferrite. Here, the ferrite is harder than the austenite. Now, back in 1924, Bain proposed a mechanism 
by which you can transform austenite into ferrite by a deformation without breaking any of the bonds. So here I have two unit cells of austenite drawn next to each other. So you can see that all the face centers have atoms and uh, the corners have atoms, so it's face-centered cubic. Now inside these two unit cells, if I mark these particular atoms as red, that is a body-centered tetragonal cell. It, it's still austenite. Okay, we are just representing the unit cell differently. You can define an infinite number of unit cells for a periodic array of points. So it's not reasonable. Uh, we, we, we should really define the cell consistent with the symmetry of the structure, but there's nothing wrong in calling austenite body-centered tetragonal. So now it becomes very clear how you could change austenite into ferrite. All you have to do is compress along this axis and expand uniformly along those axes. And you've got a cubic structure. That's called the Bain strain. Uh, I think it was a brilliant piece of uh, work by Bain because don't forget that the fact that austenite uh, has a face-centered cubic structure wasn't known until X-ray diffraction, or, uh, the Bragg law was produced by you know, the Braggs. And that was very, uh, very close to 1924. I can't actually remember when the Bragg law was invented, but 1914. 1914, thank you. Mm. OK, so a diffusion-less transformation will lead initially to a body-centered tetragonal ferrite. Okay. And the carbon atoms that are in the austenite, sorry, carbon atoms that are in the austenite, whether they are on this edge, this edge, or this edge, they all end up just on the vertical edge. So the important point is that initially, the, material, uh, the ferrite will be tetragonal. Later on, the carbon atoms might rearrange and make it cubic if you are above the ordering temperature. But initially, it must be tetragonal. So it occurred to me that maybe we are looking at the iron carbon diagram incorrectly, because that's equilibrium between cubic ferrite and austenite. What if we had equilibrium between tetragonal ferrite and austenite? So I asked my colleagues um, in um, Korea to do a first principles calculation of the iron carbon phase diagram where we have tetragonal ferrite. All right, so this is the solubility of carbon between cubic ferrite and austenite, and you can see it's very small. But if you make it tetragonal, the solubility actually increases dramatically. Okay. Now, what that means is that if this is an equilibrium phase diagram between tetragonal ferrite and austenite, there's no tendency for some of the carbon to escape into the austenite. And that explains why, you know, the partitioning of carbon doesn't go to completion relative to the ordinary iron carbon phase diagram. Now, of course, this is a first principle calculation, and in, strictly speaking, there are no approximations, but in fact, there are, okay? So we need to do some experiment to validate this. So we put the material into a synchrotron. This is a thermomechanical simulator, but we are only using heat in this case and we warm it up, and the purpose of using synchrotron is that you, you have very high energy x-rays, so you can go through a large amount of material, uh, you know, a millimeter or half a millimeter, and get very high intensity signals. That means the signal to noise ratio becomes small. And sure enough, um, so this, this is uh, going up in temperature here. Uh, it's time, but it's going up in temperature. And if we look at the symmetry of the ferrite, it is tetragonal. Okay, so here is the C and here is the A. And when the austenite uh, begins to decompose uh, and we get lots of uh, tempering, it starts to become cubic. Okay, but initially it is tetragonal. Okay, now there are more, since we published these papers, uh, other people have done experiments using different techniques. And they've even measured the thermal expansion coefficient along the cube edges, and they are different. And that cannot be the case if the symmetry is cubic. So um, this is quite interesting that we have actually retained quite a lot of carbon in the ferrite 
without any tendency for escaping into the austenite because the cell is tetragonal. Okay? Now I want to show you the limitations, all right? The limitations of this material. There are some serious limitations, and you might have noticed that we are using the object for things like shafts, for bearings, for armor, none of which need welding. Okay? You cannot weld this material. It cracks in front of your eyes if you weld it. But there is another problem. Okay? I showed you that the fracture toughness, K1C, is you know, of the order of 30, 40, 50 megapascal root meters. But the Charpy properties are appalling. You know, something like 5 joules at room temperature. Yeah? 5 joules at room temperature you know, is not respectable. <laughs> so so um, I speculated. I, I wrote a, a review article. And uh, in that, I wrote that the difference between a K1C test and a Charpy test in this scenario is that a K1C test has a sharp crack. You, know, you introduce it by fatigue, so the plastic zone at the tip is quite small. So if the austenite undergoes transformation to brittle martensite, it doesn't matter too much because it's still got all the nice matrix around it. But a Sharpie specimen has a blunt notch, okay? and the plastic zone is much bigger. So before you initiate a crack, and there, there's no crack in the first instance, before you initiate a crack, the austenite will transform. And therefore, you are propagating a crack through regions containing brittle martensite. Then one of my students was writing her literature review. And she said, look, Badisha has speculated about this, yeah? which is true. So I said, OK, you can do the experiment. So, <laughs> so I set her on the task of um, elastically bending a choppy specimen and then putting it into a synchrotron and looking at whether the austenite under the notch has decomposed. Uh, and sure enough, you know, if you, if you look over here, uh, this, is, uh, this is the sample which we elastically stressed and then put it into. So it's not a broken sample. So before you actually break the sample, that means you initiate a crack, the austenite underneath has decomposed. Okay? Which explains why you know, the Charpy toughness is really poor. Uh, but you have the decent fracture toughness, K1C. You have to put more cracks in things, Harry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, in Metrans, we published a, a paper on, in a, you know, where we introduced a system of cracks and the rolling contact fatigue improved <laughs> yeah, because of branching. So you know, if you look at a shell, it's made of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is not a tough material, but it's really hard to crack a shell because there's lots of crack deflection mechanisms in the way that a shell is created. Uh, as I said, there, there is no reasonable way of welding this material. You can see that somewhere in the heat affected zone, you will produce untempered martensite, which is very hard, yeah, because we've got about 1 weight percent of carbon. So what do we do? Okay? So we've got a project which is called uh, you know, designing a steel with an impossible combination of properties. Okay? <laughs> so the idea is that we want this structure, but we want it to be weldable. We want it to be resistant to a distributed, sudden distributed load, like a blast. And we want it to have ballistic performance as well. Okay? So steel with an impossible combination of properties, this is the task that has been set. We want a strength greater than 2 gigapascals, 30% ductility, ductility at very high strain rate, choppy impact properties at minus 40 degrees centigrade, okay? uh, weldable, cheap and large in all dimensions, mass production, and high temperature <laughs> capability. So we started this project about two and a half years ago. And we are getting somewhere. Okay? We are getting somewhere on this. We have demonstrated weldability. We've demonstrated choppy properties. Uh, they are not as good as we want. We want 30 joules at minus 40 degrees centigrade. We've achieved about 22 joules at minus 40. And we are at a stage where we went through the 60 gram melts to look at the basic predictions are correct or not. We've gone to the 100 kilogram stage. And now we are in the process of justifying a large amount of material, nine tons of material to be made. So somebody at one stage during my discussions, uh, 
explained, uh, you know, they did some really good work in your group on steels. And at the end of his talk, he said, look, um, I didn't know there was anything new to be done in steels. Just talk to me. There are lots and lots of interesting problems in steel metallurgy to solve and actually to bring into reality for commercial production. Okay, okay I will end uh, the talk there. And thank you very much. Harry, could you put on your chart where you showed BS and MS yeah. as a function of carbon concentration? Very good. Actually, I forgot two slides. Uh, okay, so this, this is, uh, this is a, a material that should take 100 years to transform because the temperature uh, of transformation is room temperature. We started this experiment in 2004, and it will be completed in 2104. So there is a sample in the Science Museum in London which you can go and inspect to see whether transformation has happened or not. But, you know, I'm not actually optimistic about the biologists uh, solving the problem of age. <laughs> so what you have to do is you have to tell your children and your grandchildren this story to verify that transformation happens at about 100 years, otherwise I will come and haunt you. Okay, so... Right. Okay, so uh, pick any carbon concentration. I don't understand what happens when you cool this alloy and you form bainite at BS. Mm. What is that product? How does it differ from the okay. product that forms when you go through MS? Yeah, so there are two essential differences. Is that at the bainite start temperature, there isn't enough driving force for diffusionless nucleation. Okay. okay, which means that it is a relatively slow nucleation rate compared with martensite, which is diffusionless nucleation. So carbon must partition. We've demonstrated that there isn't driving force for diffusionless nucleation. Then, as the nucleus grows, you release driving force because the surface to volume ratio decreases and it can grow without diffusion. That's one aspect. And secondly, that because there is plastic accommodation of the shape change. Yeah, so I didn't point out some other features on this. Uh, this is the, the shear deformation. But notice that the austenite adjacent to it is plastically relaxed. So you introduce a lot of dislocations which stops the interface from moving. So the plate never actually reaches the austenite grain boundary. It stops dead before it uh, hits a hard obstacle because these dislocations kill it, basically. So the, always the problem in the mm. controversy over what yeah. bainite is was always this mixture of a diffusional plus a diffusionless transformation. Right. So now I, so I, I think I completely mm. agree with what you just said. But then I don't understand what you, when you say carbon-free bainite. Hmm. Are you referring to a alloy without carbon, or are you referring to this transformation product in which all of the carbon has disappeared? Uh, uh, in which all of the carbon has gone into the austenite right. and not precipitated as cementite. Right. So you could argue I shouldn't call it bainite, but if I reduce the silicon content, then the austenite would decompose into well, so yeah, I, yeah. Have to, I have to object here because the, the ghost of Bob Heeman is uh, right, right, shoulder. right, right. Basically, the reaction actually, even for any bainite, happens in two stages. That first you partition carbon, and then you get precipitation. And all we have done is, uh, and others have done actually, uh, is stop the reaction here. So uh, mm. I was uh, someone who's an outsider in the field, but I taught. Hmm. Bain bainitic transformations to students. I think the term carbon-free bainite is really a confusing term. Carbide-free bainite. Okay, but the, yeah. it, that's okay. Hmm. But the, but I I thought you said no no. Okay. Carbide-free bainite. But yeah. That needs real emphasis because otherwise yeah. it's very hard to understand <coughs> what the difference is between a mountain side plate yeah. and a bainite plate. There is no difference if you remove the carbon because uh, the nucleation mechanisms are exactly the same. And the, the reason why I showed this graph, and I emphasize that you have to maintain a gap. If instead of carbon, I increase the nickel concentrations, these two merge 
and you know you lose bainite altogether. Mm -hmm. yeah. Many of the high strength ferritic steels have a low brittle to ductile transition. What is it in your case? How, how is brittle to ductile curves affect? In this case, you know, it's well above room temperature because we only get five joules at room temperature. <laughs> yeah. In a chop impact test. Yes, but oh, so the brittle ductile is always defined as a sharpie or is uh, it? Oh, I see what you mean. So it fails in a ductile manner, but the impact properties are very yeah. poor. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. And in simple tension? Single tension, 27% ductility. Uh, how low can you go in temperature? Haven't, uh, haven't done low temperature tensile tests, actually. That's a good point. Okay. Mm. So how do you, sorry. I wanted to ask you, say, uh, you presented the first principles calculation results. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a standard of physical argument why it's energetically more favorable to accommodate a high carbon concentration by the trigonal distortion as opposed to dislocations in the cubic structure? Uh, so, uh, I'm not arguing that it's more favorable than dislocations, oh. yeah? But if you have a tetragonal cell, then the first carbon atom to go into the C axis actually helps the next carbon atom to go into the C axis and so on. But if you have dislocations available, yeah. Sources of they could generate themselves in some form. Could these calculations you mentioned really prove that, nevertheless, you would expect that the triangular distortion, or would then the dislocation or hosting of the carbon be energetically yeah. favorable? Right. So, so Maurice Cohen, uh, um, uh, yeah, who was at MIT, actually did that calculation uh, uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, where he had a, a map showing, you know, dislocation density and the amount of carbon trapped. So, if you have a high enough dislocation density, you can trap all the carbon there in cotrel atmospheres. But here, uh, you can see that the carbon is at dislocations, and you can measure the radius of the cotrel atmosphere to show that it's more or less saturated, and there is carbon remaining in solid solution, and that could only be done using that atom probe method that Francisca Caballero did. Ah, sorry. Um, so conceptually, when you go from the gamma to bainite transformation, you should, if you do a continuous cooling experiment, mm -hmm. uh, you should see that the transformation happens at a certain temperature, and then the lattice parameter continues to change as the carbon diffuses out. Right. So. Um, yes. I mean, that should be a yeah. complete, uh, to me, a definitive yeah. uh, proof of this transformation happening sure. as a function sure. of time. So, uh, yeah. So the problem is, you know, these experiments have been done, but everyone analyzes the data in terms of BCC. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a paper just published in ACTA by some other people who have looked at their data and found the, the Benedict ferrite to be tetragonal. This, uh, I just got it sent two days ago. Yes, so I. Measure the tetragonality yeah. electron diffraction pattern? Sorry? In the electron diffraction pattern? Uh, so, what they did was lattice imaging. Hmm? And they could show that along this direction, the despacing is different from this direction for the two, uh, for, for the same equivalent planes. And they calculated the tetragonality from there. And they also had some old X ray data which they reanalyzed. Because, you know, we all assume that Benedict ferrite is cubic. Uh, it's exactly like, you know, your austenite. Yeah. Yeah? I mean, it could be BCC, but your lattice parameter change should be, uh, yeah, should be different depending on the carbon content. Right. right. So, I mean, mm. it could go either way, right? I mean, yeah. then, right, then you, it should be definitive in that way whether it's BCC or BCD, if you mm. do high temperature XRD experiment. So let me just point out one, one thing why it's a very difficult thing to do. <coughs> yeah, so if you, if you take your normal steel and you're plotting an X-ray diffraction pattern, yeah? mm -hmm. and let's say this is the 110 peak, mm -hmm. yeah? these structures have a lot of strain. The peak is actually like this. 
it's, it's exactly like the X-ray diffraction patterns that you showed, you know? So you really need to look at the asymmetry of the peak using, you know, analysis. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in your lecture, you provided uh, uh, example of uh, steel and, uh, for receiving nanostructure. Which contain uh, one point uh, chromium. Is it possible to receive this microstructure for plain carbon steel? I don't think so. I tell you why. Because the transformations become fast, and you know to prevent the perlite transformation, ferrite transformation, or cementite formation at high temperatures, you need a certain amount of hardenability, especially for a large object. So the chromium and manganese were to retard those, yeah, yeah. So it'd be interesting, following up on Gerhard's comment, that it'd be interesting to do a head-to-head -head comparison hmm. for lytic steel, since they're widely used, and either the low-carbon, carbide-free, magnetic rail, mm -hmm. or the new stuff. Right. That would be very useful just to do the head-to-head. Couple to brittle transition, depending on however you compare it, mm. tension and then sharpie. Yeah. Because I think you find that the prolytic steels have a very poor impact toughness on yeah. yeah. even at room temperature. Mm. So it'd be interesting to compare them. And they're used all the time. Yeah. So uh, the rail steel is a lower strength version and definitely has a higher toughness even at a low temperature. But it's a lower strength. Yeah. Not that much. So at minus 40, we can get 30 joules in that. Yeah. 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 Mm. What is the hardness of the rail steel? It's about 400 wickers. Yeah, and rock will see. I think it depends on the perlite space. Mm. So what, what's, it's, it's similar to perlitic rail. Do you know the hardness of perlitic rail in Rockwell? Depends on the perlite spacing, mm. the 40s, 50s, and that yeah. range. Okay. Mm. It depends on whether the, how slowly cooled the yeah. perlite, the perlite into right. the Mellor space. Right. Yeah. That's good. Mm. Do you have any other questions? Jim, would you like to? I did, not a question per se, but you know, we talked a little bit at the beginning about this connection between practicality and science. And it, come to a seminar and you hear a really elegant scientific talk and you go away impressed. And then you hear a lecture where there's a strong connection to practical applications and how they're really realized through science. And you can be almost dazzled. But then you hear three talks in a row <laughs> that build one on each other and, and even at a higher position at a very elegant start, you have to use the word sublime. And so I think I speak for everybody in the room when I say we're tremendously grateful for your time here and the information that you've delivered to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay.